Hello there, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this APMG webinar debate. I hope everyone's keeping well. Uh, it's Mark Constable here with the APMG team in the UK and today's debate is focused on the current and potential influence of data and data analytics on the project management community. Uh, in a few moments, I'll hand you over to our debate chair, um, APMG CEO Richard Farrow, uh, who will explain a, a little bit more about uh, the approach to the, today's session and introduce you to our debate panellists, Martin Paver and Graham Chemish, uh, who between them bring a wealth of, of uh, project management experience to this debate today. Um, before that, let me quickly cover a few logistics for the session. So the first point to note is we are recording the session and everyone that's registered will receive a follow-up email as soon as the recording is available on our website. Uh, <clears> secondly, <throat> you have the opportunity to submit questions at any point throughout the session. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on those as we go. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a bit of time towards the end of the session just to address any of those questions. Um, your feedback is very valuable to us, so if you have any views on the format um, or perhaps if you might be interested in a future debate um, or just any general points about the session, uh, do feel free to share that. You'll have my email address from reminder emails and also the follow-up emails uh, that, that will come. And also something that's not on screen but something to look out for in this session, it's, it's quite interactive. We've got a poll at different stages um, and as I say, Richard will explain a bit more about that in a few moments and that's a good time to hand over so Richard over to you. Thank you very much Mark. Um, welcome everybody and to this, uh, this debate I'm just trying to get my webcam on which was worth that's it. So welcome everybody to the debate as, as Mark says this is a debate about whether data analytics is um, helping or hindering the professionals in programme project management in their work. We're joined today by uh, Graham Chemish, and I will let Graham explain his background in a minute, who's a very experienced programme project engineer, project manager, worked on projects around the world, and Martin Paver, who has built a bit of a reputation as a guru in the use of analytics to help improve programme project management and to move that forward. As Mark says, I think the key thing today is about you, the audience. So after each of the rounds of debate, we're going to ask you to vote to see whether we've actually moved the dial, whether there's people, more people in favor of the motion or whether there's more people against the motion. So I would ask everybody to pick one of the four options as we get into the polling stations. We're going to have three rounds of debate. So the protagonists will open with their well thought through, well considered opening arguments. <clears throat> we will then have a, a vote on how well they've done. We'll then move on to round two, which will be a bit shorter, when they will be responding to those opening arguments, <clears throat> and then another vote, and then round three. And then we'll actually have a summary to see how well we've done. <clears throat> we'll have some time probably for some questions at the end, so please feel free to use the chat, chat box to raise any questions. The whole process will probably take about 45, 40 minutes to 45 minutes, so hopefully at the end there will be some time for questions. So if we could uh, move on, Mark, to the next slide. So this is the, um, the motion, the increased use of dashboards and performance metrics are de-skilling and removing the professionalism for project delivery. So Graham is speaking in favour of the motion and Martin is speaking against it. So I'd like to ask um, Graham just to say a few words about himself and then open with his uh, opening remarks, his opening argument. So over to you, Graham. Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to, to all. I am, I am British, but I'm based uh, currently in Cambodia, which is proving to be a lot safer than the UK. My career started uh, way back in the 70s. Uh, the first full-time project was in 77, the Scottish Highlands, and uh, was really a, a, a wonderful project. And it was a springboard for many of the things I've done since. And a lot of my experiences in there uh, with contractors on uh, the construction of uh, oil and gas, um, uh, projects, the uh, construction of platforms and so on. 
So um, that's where a lot of my experience was gained. And I, I must say, uh, it, I didn't realize at the time, but in 1977, the, um, the, the quality of the people I had the uh, good fortune to work with uh, gave me uh, a lot of insights and a lot of a good experience. And then that was uh, um, added to by a project in Canada in Newfoundland in, in, in the 90s. And uh, so a lot of my uh, knowledge and experiences from from big projects, but also a few uh, a few smaller ones uh, in the in the UK and and other other places in the world. So that's thank you very much, Graham. I'm going to have to ask you to move on and start with your um, opening argument, please. Okay. In reviewing Martin's recent post on LinkedIn, I sense his excitement in how influential data can be for project management. I felt a similar excitement back in the 80s when it first became Sorry, God, sorry Graham. Sorry, I yep. forgot. We need to have a poll before we start. So, oh, uh, Mark, okay. could you ask everybody to go to the polling booth to sort of vote for the motion? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the first poll, um, yeah, first poll is on screen. So, it's uh, just getting your current views on, the, on that current motion. So, you've got four options there. Uh, so, if you agree, do not agree, perhaps undecided, or maybe even don't care. I'll just give everyone a few more moments for that. Okay, I think we'll close that one there. So, and you should be able to see the results on screen. Uh, so for the first one, we've got 19% um, agree, 52% 50, do not agree, 24% uh, undecided, and 5% don't care. Thank you very much. So there's a very strong, um, strong view that people do not agree with the, with the motion. So interesting. So, um, <clears throat> Over to you, Graham, to um, to argue for the motion. Okay, thank you, and, and sorry for not realising there was a, an initial poll. Okay, time starts now. In reviewing Martin's recent posts on LinkedIn, I sense his excitement in how influential data can be for project management. I felt a similar excitement back in the 80s when it first became possible to run a critical path analysis in minutes on a PC instead of hours on a mainframe, and subsequently when what if analyses became possible. I also had the freedom to create other tools for tracking the main project act activities using similar relational database technology that the early Artemis project management software employed. One major difference now is that there are numerous project management tools and the ability to capture and analyze data is endless. The business needs have remained much the same whilst the capacity of technology has grown considerably. Unfortunately, the capacity of management systems to make relatively simple tasks more complicated has also grown. This is not a criticism of the EMS and ERP developers. It is an observation that organizations often fail to configure all encompassing management software in a way that limits the functionality to just the essential needs for each project. Maybe a topic for another debate. The influence of factual data and the importance of developing and maintaining a reliable basis for managing projects are not in question. What is being debated here is what I consider to be an unhealthy increase in the dependence on data analytics, especially performance metrics, and the potential de-skilling and impact it can have by diverting attention away from other more vital management tasks, activities such as thinking ahead and taking steps to facilitate future works and thereby mitigate risks. The use of project management software and having access to continually updated project data and other relevant information sources undoubtedly results in some informed decisions being taken. However, most of the major strategic decisions are made with little or no reference to any data analyses. In my experience, success is primarily achieved with practical knowledge, common sense, insights, and the collective skills of a group of individuals who live and breathe every aspect of a project. Data analytics can be an unwelcome distraction and risk taking a lot of the fun out of managing projects. 
The notion that projects succeed better using rigorous, rigorously applied data analytics is fundamentally flawed. It is oversimplistic to think that data can be the main driver when decisions are based on so many variables. The management of projects that have many unknowns cannot be turned into an inexact science and then black and white data analytics be relied on to provide answers for all the gray areas. Graham, you've gone quiet. I can see your laps moving. We've lost sound. Graham, we've lost you. Mark, can you hear Graham? No, no, we've lost the uh, lost its audio, unfortunately. Key construction and contracting strategies. Back. No data science. No data science is required to tell you that it's a good idea to minimize the critical path using faster construction methods and delegating specialist or high risk work to contractors with a proven expertise and equipment. If the strategy happens to be a new one, then there will be no previous data anyway on which to base the key decisions. The 57 story building that was built in China in the 19 days in 20, 2015 is a good example of what can be achieved by those who are capable of thinking outside the box. Judging by the way that many projects are executed using the same basic methods that have been in use for years, it seems to me that data science is failing to create innovative solutions. At best, it is just fine-tuning old solutions. So why expend a lot of effort in using data science if the benefits are limited and largely unproven? Efforts should always be maximized on seeking innovative solutions then fully supporting those who actually do the productive work. Richard asked that we provide evidence to support our propositions, such as statistics, references, quotes, analogies. I apologize for failing to do this, although I've attempted to find some unbiased information to include. My proposition is based on many years of hands-on learning, keen observation, and a logical mind. I intend to expand more on my logical thinking in the second session, and it remains to be seen if I convince the participants here with just my findings and opinions alone. Thank you very much, Graham. Well presented, well delivered, within time. So I'd like to move on to Martin Paver, who's going to speak against the motion. So Martin, are you still with us? So you have a minute just to explain a little bit about yourself for people who don't know you, Martin, and then we'll start your uh, your opposing argument. So over to you. Thanks a lot, Richard. I appreciate that. And welcome, everybody. So my name is Martin Paver. I'm the Chief Exec of uh, Projected Success. I've been a project professional for the last 30 years. I've run some big jobs as well. So I've led a billion dollar mega project and I've led a $10 billion PMO. I've seen that we make the same mistakes time and time again. And four years ago, I pivoted my business uh, and started to focus very much on project data analytics. So that's it, Richard. Thank you very much. Now let's see whether you could have your argument against Graham as, as succinct or whether you're going to need the whole five minutes. So over to you, Martin. And please don't hack me as well, because I saw that somebody hacked um, Graham, so he went silent for a little bit, which gives me a tactical advantage. So yes, well done for the bugs in the system somewhere. So um, I'll start straight away with the tactical advantage. So should we start now? All good? Yes, please. Right, off we go. So in terms of Graham's pitch, I fundamentally agree that data is not the answer alone. If we did this, we'd replace every single project professional with bots. And I don't think that's a viable proposition. There's a major human component in projects. But what we need to do is to provide the space for humans to do what they are best at. We need to move away from these repetitive process centric bits of work and let computers take the strain. If we've got a deeper understanding of project and team performance, we know where to direct our effort. How good is the team at preempting risk? How good are they at estimating? How many RFIs do we want to receive from a, a design house? And is performance improving? Are my project team starts started to burn out? Are my project team with me, 
or have I lost them? Another challenge that we've got is that we keep making the same mistakes time and time again. We've got the GAO, we've got the NAO and parliamentary reports which keep saying the same things. The concept of taking a $1 billion project full of complexity and summarising that into a five page lessons learned report is complete madness. Those projects are complex, involve a vast array of dependencies and interactions. The latest developments in data science can help us to understand which of these interactions are most predisposed to going astray. We can pull out those patterns. If we understand this better, we gain new superpowers. Our spider sensors will be alerted way in advance of what is currently possible. An organization such as Network Rail have already demonstrated that artificial intelligence can improve forecasting accuracy by 54%. What we also do is challenge bias. So we've got recency bias, anchoring bias, confirmation bias. We leverage this vast exhaust bloom of data and begin to build up the evidence which underpins decision making. But there will always be gung ho project professionals who know best. They've got years of experience who know exactly what is going on at every single part of a project 100% of the time. Those people who manage by heuristics and they don't need all that evidence. And if they've got the evidence, it's out of date and the data is not where it should be. I sort of agree with some of that because one of the greatest attributes of project managers is to find ways of getting things done, is to beat the odds. We must not throw this away, but we've got to temper it. The stats from Oxford University of 12,000 projects show that one in 200 projects delivers inside of the sanction cost, time and benefits envelope. Only 0.5%. We need a different approach. Would you want a project team who understand the project management body of knowledge and got badges in PRINCE2 or a project team who can show you where to focus your effort and see these issues way in advance. Will future mega project project management, project managers, sorry, be those with 30 years of experience, or will it be people who can lead, who can leverage this data and navigate their way through complexity? I've managed a mega project, I've got 30 years of experience, but I know when I need to adapt and that time has come. This isn't binary, but we must focus much more attention on leveraging all of this hard won experience and using computers to make human input more effective. We supercharge our capabilities and deliver a step change in delivery performance. I've not proposed that we've got an Alexa based unicorn sat in the corner with all the answers. But I do believe we must leverage the evidence that we collectively hold. That's it, Richard. Thank you very much. You're both uh, <clears throat> you're both well in time. So uh, I think we um, we should now move, if we can, to the voting. As you can tell, the guys had prepared their opening speeches. Um, so they were very calm and very uh, balanced in putting forward the argument in for Graham and actually putting forward an opposing view from, from Martin. When we move on to the next round, of course, they now have to respond to those opening pitches. So we'll see whether the gung-ho pro project professionalism, project professionals or the bots will come to the fore. So before we go on to that, can we just have another vote to see whether they've been able to persuade anyone uh, within the audience to move one way or the other. So over to you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, second poll should be on screen for everybody now. Yes, it is. Uh, okay, we've uh, give 30 seconds or so. Thanks to both.
Okay, I think we'll close that one now. Yeah. Um, and the dials move so slightly. The... Uh, ah, so not much of a results. change though. <clears throat> well, I'm very pleased we moved the don't care. So we now actually have everybody within the audience actually caring one way or another. So I think that's a very positive outcome from round one. So we're moving on to round two. <clears throat> and over to you, Graham. And uh, you only have three minutes to respond to Martin's um, comments. So your time starts now. OK, thanks, Martin. In essence, Martin and I agree that brain power combined with the effective use of computer power increases the chance of success. We also agree there is always a major human component involved. Where we disagree is on how best computer power can be used and how to get the best productivity out of each of the project teams. I consider my approach to be simpler and more practical. I won't respond to each of Martin's comments in detail, but it's interesting to note from the Oxford University study that only one in 200 projects from 12,000 delivers within the sanctioned cost, time and benefits envelope. This is a, a dismal result considering all the new techniques and technology available and all the project management certifications that exist. I agree something needs to change, but this is an example of a statistic that on its own provides no solution. Martin also refers to using data science to gain super superpowers. Project management doesn't need caped crusaders. Teams work best together if they're on the same wavelength. Soccer teams need to get on the same wavelength to score goals and project teams need to be on the same length to work collaborative in achieving goals. If anyone in a project management team believes they play a more significant role than, than others, then they are unlikely to create a collaborative environment. Good management is not about managers increasing their personal prowess. It is more about managers knowing what the productive teams need to enable them to perform well. My finding is that there are very few on construction projects who are not keenly interested in knowing as much as possible about what they're building. Most are very dedicated and deserve to know what their role is, that their role is as important as anyone else's. The larger and more complex a project is, the wider the knowledge gaps become and many are left flying blind with little or no chance to do any forward thinking themselves. Instead of spending time um, focusing uh, on uh, data science and performance dashboards, etc. I believe it is potentially far more constructive for managers to take steps to help ensure everyone knows what's going on, what is planned, information that is presented in, in a meaningful way can reap immeasurable benefits. Whenever you watch grand designs, which I'm sure most of you have, there's usually a, a 3D walkthrough graphics created showing what the build entails, which I always find very enlightening. In the 90s, they used to laboriously create 2D graphical illustrations showing what was planned at each stage of the project, which, which proved hugely popular. Nowadays there's, seconds. nowadays, there's wonderful 4D te technology that can be used not only to show what is planned, but also when, by day, week, month, and whatever is needed. Leave the Gantt charts, histograms, S-curves, and dashboards, etc., for those who can best derive benefit from them and maximize the use of meaningful graphics to help get everyone onto the same wavelength. I realize this may not be appropriate for all types of project, but there's usually a method that gets the measures across clearly. I'll end, as I'm running out of time, I'll end with the old tongue in cheek adage, if a project fails, it's because of the management. If it succeeds, it's despite the management. Okay. Okay, well, <clears throat> we'll have to finish it there. Thank you very much, Graham. So uh, over to you, Martin, to um, to rebut what uh, what Graham has said. Okay, so okay, you, right. We, you have you have three minutes. In terms of Graham's points, he's raised uh, three or four points there, which I'd like to challenge. So the first one is about getting people on the same wavelength. Now, that's through things like common data environments. It's making sure that people have got the same understanding of reality. And that's not the heuristics of what's going on. That's data-driven, evidence-driven fact on what's going on. He talks about collaborative goals, and those collaborative goals are all supported by data. It's the evidence against plan. Are you getting to where you want to be, and are you getting the benefit out of it that you actually need? He talks about complex projects, right? And a great um, complex project in the UK is something like HS2. 
and I disagree with the fact that it's a complex project. Right? It's got complexity inherent in it, but it's laying mile after mile after mile of track. It's putting in signals time and time and time again. It's building stations time and time and time again. That is all data driven. It's got a massive data plume associated with it. If we leverage that data, it's like Formula One teams, right? Would we start to um, let the Formula One team really perform without all of their diagnostics on board and the feedback from their team, right? They are very, very data centric because they can squeeze more and more performance out of it. It's exactly the same with projects. We want to squeeze more performance from that complex project in terms of laying track, putting signals in, uh, digging holes and tunnels, etc. What we also need to understand is what's going to go wrong next? And you've got a project manager who's probably worked on 10 projects in his life, who's worked on big ones, who's probably worked on 10. Um, if we've got this database of every single project that's ever been, we've got millions of projects in that data set. So we can then use stats, we can use probability, and we can use artificial intelligence then to tell us what is likely to go wrong on this project. So all those things, those black swans we talk about, which were the unforeseeable events, they become foreseeable because they're part of the data set. And what the computer does is it brings it to bear. It shows us where to look and it demonstrates to us we can make a significant difference. And in terms of those stats, so the 0.5% of projects, if we keep tweaking this, which is what we've been doing for the last 20 years, we're not going to really change that number. So the only way we can change it is to get into the evidence and start to drive you significant. Have 20 seconds. So I'd say the experience is really important, but we need to temper that experience with this massive data set of our hard won collective experience, which has come about through a huge amount of investment. That's Thank it, you Jared. very much, Mark. Thank you very much. So, um, Mark, if we could go to the poll. Um, just to, so we've, we've heard uh, from both um, Martin and Graham on their argument. Um, we've heard about uh, black swans. We've heard about HS2. We've heard about Formula One. We didn't hear about any white. Didn't hear anything about white elephants in in that round. But uh, again, if you could cast your vote on whether you agree, do not agree, or whether you are still undecided. Thanks, Richard. The poll's on screen, so uh, it's been on screen in the background for a few moments. So I'll give uh, another 15, 20 seconds or so. OK, let's close it there and share the results. Well, that's the same as the last round. There, there has been no change. <clears throat> So I'm sorry, chaps, you haven't been able to convince anyone to move their position and we're into the third round. So you think you're going to have to uh, take the gloves off and have some more emotional, impassioned pleas to support your side of the argument if you're going to move the dial. So um, you're up next for the challenge, Graham. So uh, over to you. Okay, welcome back. Well, I'm I'm I noticed that the attendees have only been in the in the low 30s. So uh, I'm afraid that it's a disappointing that the statistics are, uh, are based on such a low a low number of attendees, which is a pity. Um, I am um, I understand that there is now considerably more data available and the capacity to to capture more data. But um, some of the projects I've worked on, and I know we're we tend, tend to talk about the the, the more uh, the bigger projects. But you have to consider: is is there is there the time uh, to continually uh, refer to the the, the databases of, of all this information? I think uh, a lot of decisions have to be taken quite quickly, and and based on uh, on conditions and situations that may not have really occurred much in the past. You know, there's uh, difficult ground conditions, piling conditions, tunneling conditions, um, conditions in tidal waters. 
that where there's there may not be much data to rely on i think if you get into the habit of of, of continually looking at the past uh, data to to make decisions then potentially there, there, there's a risk of um uh, of, of delaying the decision being taken i i would i would like to feel that if i need to make any major decisions that i can pull on you know phone a friend or whatever way you need to to, to come up with a, a good answer and uh and, and if there's time and if if there's resources available there's always a cost implication the more effort that goes into uh, uh going into data science and analyzing data to me there is less time being spent talking to your teams uh talking about future um events and so on the, 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 to me the focus is needs to be on in a more practical way in uh, in bringing up to speed and and uh, and meeting with talking with the uh, the various teams and understanding all their difficulties and mitigating, mitigating the risks without a continual reference to past data. It's like uh, what I'm finding in Asia that there's, um, uh, and, and a lot of other countries now, people are, are failing now to, to I, I know this is a much smaller event, but they're failing to, to, to be able to add up a few numbers without seeking a, a, a calculator. Now, when you're on a big project, you need to be making decisions. Yeah, Twenty seconds, go ahead. Quickly and uh, and um, yeah, I there that I I agree in in having uh, access to all this information. But uh, the more you develop the ability to 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 earn more practical insights, then the quicker the potentially the decisions uh, can be taken. I don't need I think to, I have to finish it there. Sorry, yeah, you've run you. out of time, Graham. Yeah. So over to you then, uh, Martin, to um, to put forward your closing arguments as we're now into the uh, the final round. Thanks for that, Graham. I think the problem with the project delivery at the moment is exactly what you're talking about. You know, we spend too much time phoning friends and going around having lots of conversations, random conversations. What we need to do is start to focus those conversations and data tells us where to look. It tells us what conversations to have and with which people based upon the conditionality of the project. We can do that through experience and I'm sure there's some seasoned professionals out there with 30 years of experience, but there's also junior people and they don't know where to look and they've probably not got a friend to, a, a friend to phone. So what do we do with those people? You talked about the tunneling conditions and that we might not have experienced those tunneling conditions before. But the problem may not be about the conditions. It's about the use of the asset. It's the use of the machine. It's the logistics trail that goes with it. And those at a functional level will have been seen before. So I'm not advocating that we throw away this experience and turn everybody into a bot. I don't think that's going to work. Right? What we need to do is wake up and stop phoning friends and start to think about all of that data and all of that experience is codified in that knowledge base, right? And what humans being do, do us is bring it to life. And we can find out if a certain person has experienced that before because it's in the data set. So instead of phoning your friend, you can phone the expert because it's in your data set. And that data set is gonna tell us that's the person that we need to go and have the conversation with, yeah? So I think the days of this experience driven uh, project delivery was great in the 80s and 90s. It's not great anymore. We've got this massive data set, we're just ignoring. And at the moment, I see project after project, I work on a lot of construction projects with clients who train a lot of people up and I see the quality of the data and it's woeful. And that's because we don't value it. And we don't value it, we don't see the, the opportunity inherent in that data. I and mean, I've seen some organizations at the forefront of this and they are transforming their project delivery. Do you want to be an Argos type organization? It's a shop in the UK, which has moved online and it's basically a digital shop. Or do you want to be an Amazon, which is a, a fully data centric business? And you've seen where Amazon have massively outperformed everybody else. 
And do you want to be a Formula One team with a load of streaming diagnostics on your data? Or do you want to be driving around and using the experience of your driver because the driver knows best? It's a team performance and data. So analytics is a key component of that team and of that performance. 20 seconds. Uh, I've got three minutes on my clock, actually, so I'm done. Excellent. Well, thank you. Maybe you started your um, maybe you started your clock before I started mine, so you had the time. So we've um, we've heard the two protagonists. They've uh, they had their opening presentations. They then had the debate about um, what the others had said. We've heard about uh, conversations. We've heard about data sets. We've heard about phone an expert, not phone a friend. So can we go to the final poll, Mark, please? Yeah, final poll is on screen now. Thank you. Did you say there's a massive prize as well, Richard, for the winning team? Is that right? Yeah, there is a massive prize. <laughs> you spend a day with me after lockdown. <laughs> Priceless. Okay. Have we got okay. a have we got a result yet, Mark? Yeah, I'll close it there. Uh, I think people are thinking very carefully, though. The time it's taken to make the vote, so we're at least making people think if they're not if they're not entirely shifting. Uh, let's put those uh, put the results for the final one on screen. Hey, oh okay. dear. massive change. Oh dear. <laughs> it's, the, it's the agrees have been have moved to the do not agree. So uh, yeah, yeah, Mark, can you go back? Can you remove this so all three of us can be on screen? Sure. We've still got 21% sat on the fence still. That's quite disappointing. You know, I'd have liked to have shifted some of those. Well, I think sure, those may be, they may be the big thinkers among us. There are, there are only 30 attendees. I mean, I, I'm not entirely disappointed with the result, although my my final session obviously lost a few votes. Yeah. Well done, Martin. I meant to pick that point up as well, is that your opening comment in round three was all based around data <laughs> it's only there's only 30 people so it's not a representative statistically robust <laughs> conclusion <laughs> yes well, i should have picked that up in the first statement but there we go but if, if i could try and summarize what i what i what i got out of it as well there's an interesting view that says you can use data not to phone a friend but to phone the expert so maybe the data allows us to focus in talking to the people that we need to talk to rather than the people that we know. And and I, I, I smiled at the halcyon days of the 80s and the 90s when we didn't have the data. I'm not sure the projects in the 80s and 90s were particularly successful. And it will be interesting how a data driven society actually does make a difference. But is it about the data or is it more about the psychology and the way people will use that data? to work collaboratively to deliver better programs and projects. Because for the last 50 years, we haven't even moved the dial. You know, the research, the reports from 50 years ago was about 30% of projects succeeded, maybe 50%. And I think the research is still about 30 to 50% of projects are considered a success. Not quite as draconian as the statistic Martin had from Oxford, where it was 0.05%. I haven't seen that in any other statistics but that seems to be like a multiplication of a multiplication of a multiplication <laughs> to arrive at, a, at data but i think um certainly the the general view of the audience was that um it's not making it's not bad for us the use of uh, dashboards and data in fact it's good for the project community so i think that's um that is a strong conclusion. We do have some time for any questions, Mark, if anyone's actually put any questions in the chat. Uh, actually, very quiet on the questions. 
uh, section at the moment. But I will let you okay. know. Soon. So if anyone wants to sort of either raise a question on what you've heard or any other question to, to Martin in terms of project analytics and data sets or anything to Graham, please feel free to use the chat. And we'll just give people a minute or two to see if they uh, can think of anything before we move into the um, move towards the end. Yeah, a couple that have popped in, Richard. So there was one, one that's more of a comment, but uh, I think there was a, a change in the result was caused uh, when we started talking about the Amazon example. Uh, so that's one one point of view. Um, uh, Christine says, I feel there is a place for analytics, but it doesn't do away with the need for fundamental project management skills, uh, especially in areas of smaller, less repetitive projects. Yeah, I think you're getting some nods there, Christine. I think no one would disagree with you there. Yeah, and some and uh, yeah, Sarah makes the, the similar point. Really, it's uh, it's it's maybe we should be focused on a combination of data and soft skills. Yeah, yeah. Again, I don't think anyone's disagreeing with you. And uh, uh, Gregor says, um, I think the most uh, critical thing is to figure out which uh, data uh, are is the most relevant for the for the project manager to drive the project successfully. Um, and then there is a question, what, what methods of using data would you recommend? That's probably one for Martin. Ah, that's, one, that's one for Martin. Over to you to answer that. In terms of using data, I think you've got to just start somewhere. All right, so start with dashboards. Um, and don't just create a dashboard. I see a lot of people doing this. They just rock up and they put a dial on it and they put a bar chart on it and then go and stick a map on it. Everyone puts a map on their dashboards because it looks nice. Right? Always think about what is the problem statement which you're trying to answer. What's your biggest pain point at the moment? If you can work out your biggest pain point, you start there and you work out uh, basically if you've got the data to underpin solving that pain point. If you've not, then why not? Because it means you're flying in fog. And if you're flying in fog, you're not managing your project very well. So even that feedback loop itself is really important for you because you can then start to improve your data streams. So that fog then starts to lift and you can see where you're going and see a lot further out as well. And if you see further out, you start to preempt things and it starts to mitigate some of your variance. Is that helpful? It was to me. So hopefully it was to, uh, to other people on the call. Have you got any other questions there, Mark? Uh, no, no more questions at this stage. So I think we can uh, begin, to, begin to wrap up there. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Yeah, so, uh, so to close out the session, so just a bit of a, a bit of further information on screen for you there. So at the top there, you can see the link to to uh, our website and also our Twitter handle. But we're also very active on LinkedIn and Instagram. So if you want to see details of any of our portfolio of certifications, do do check out the website. And um, and if you if you're particular interest in in data and data analytics or um, it's, uh, it's that there's an element of that in your role now or you see an element of that in a future role then we'd certainly encourage you to check out the the big data training and certification that we that we deliver um, and there's a couple of links there at the bottom to find out more and we will of course include these these details in the follow-up email um, so just moving on to a bit more inf information so this final slide is where you can find out more about the um, the initiatives that uh, Martin's involved with around um, project data analytics. So you see in the top right there, you've got uh, links to the uh, data analytics sites and the, and the task force, and you'll find details on there about meetups. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you've got Martin's company itself. Uh, and if you want to con uh, connect with either Martin or Graham, you can see the links to their LinkedIn profiles at the bottom there. Um, Mark, before so, you leave yeah. that, Mark, mm. before you leave that, Martin, haven't you recently done something in apprenticeships to do with big data that you could just say a few words about thanks richard yeah so, so we've set up an apprenticeship in the uk so uh it's in england basically each of the nations have got a slightly different rule set so it's based in england for people with 50 percent of their time in england um and it's basically what government do is they tax an organization with a pay bill of more than uh, three million pounds and they put 0.5 percent of that away so you can start to develop new skills. And it's about driving up UK productivity, basically. And a lot of companies aren't spending that money. 
So it's free training money that's available to you. Um, and that's called the apprenticeship levy. So if you go to your training organization, then you can draw down on that levy. If you've got a pay bill of less than three million pounds, then government picks up 95% of the bill. So it's a really great scheme. It's an opportunity to get some new skills and experience and knowledge. Uh, and it's very practical. We run hackathons and things like that. And 5,000 pounds prize money for the next hackathon as well, which is on the 20th and, and 21st of March. Thank you very much, Martin. Okay, back to you, Mark. And Richard, did you want to say a final few words about a potential masterclass with Martin? Yeah, I mean, if anyone on the call is interested in sort of spending time with Martin, you know, we'd like to sort of run a masterclass where Martin can go into more detail in some of the techniques and the tools and the findings that he has. I actually have attended a couple of sessions that Martin's run. I must admit the technology and some of the maths and the terminology goes over my head, but the findings are very, very enlightening when you actually see what people can do with a data set and a problem and what conclusions they can draw. So if anyone is interested in, as I say, an online masterclass with Martin, if you could sort of put that in the chat box and then we will get back to you with that and together with the information we have around sort of big data training and what have you. I wasn't going to take issue with Martin earlier in the in the presentation when he said certifications are okay but you don't need them. I would suggest you do need them as well as experience. <laughs> but then that's what APMG's business is. So we have a lot of certifications in program project management and in data. So please check out our website. If you want to know more about data, we'll arrange a session for Martin to uh, to wow you with what you can do with some obscure data sets. And before we go, he said something to me that I thought was very, very telling. And the client of his said to him, why would we share our data with a competitor? Because that's our intellectual property. And Martin's comment was, so what's the value of your intellectual property if it's just locked away in the cupboard and you're not using it? And I think we can get very precious with some of this stuff. And maybe if we did share more and were more open, we could learn more from each other. And that might actually make a difference because somewhere along the line, we have to make a difference to the way we deliver programs and projects because the old world isn't working and isn't sustainable. So on that happy note, if you would like to add in the chat room, if you like the masterclass, we will arrange that. And I think it just leads me to ask to thank Graham and Martin on behalf of all the audience for their contribution and in particular the exchanges that we move through the debate. And uh, if anyone would like to know more, please use the website, please use the, um, the chat box on here. Thank you very much for joining and have a really good day. I'll hand over to Martin and Graham just to say goodbye. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for joining. Good to see you. Yeah, it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Bye.